all the, apply to neuroscience. So I want to present the organizers. Uh, is myself, Hilda Sardeira, Professor Hilda Sardeira, and uh, Jesus Gómez Gardeñas, who is uh, in the hotel waiting for the other lecturer that just arrived. Um, Jesus and I will impart uh, classes. Also, Professor Anamador Gial and Professor Osvaldo Rosso over there. Um, so basically, the school, as you know, the program, I'm not going to go too much. To the, too many details because there's information in the web page. But as you can see here, I, I will uh, do a general introduction to these topics of the school. And then Ana, uh, Jesus, and Jordi will give the first presentations today. Then there will be a student's presentations by you. You can see, oh, there they are. Splendid, hello. <laughs> How do I go back? So, no, I don't want, uh, oh, here. So those are the guys. Um, yeah. um, these presentations, we beg you, try to be concise, short, explain who you are, where you come from, what you're doing at the moment. You can also say what you are interested in. The idea is to present each other, so later on we can make groups of students to work in the hands-on sessions that we have in the three afternoons, okay? So those are for doing exercises. The, there's a large diversity of the level of the students here and the topics of the students. So we will try to uh, adapt to all your interests and needs and experience. And there will be different type of exercises proposed by us and you can choose. So we will organize small groups. You will work on this exercise in the afternoons, and there is a last session here in which each group will, again, briefly, because we have a, quite a, a lot of people here, briefly explain what you did and uh, share the experience with others. And there is a colloquium in the afternoon. This here is a, is a colloquium of the institute, and is for us, but also for other people uh, working here. It will be done by Jesus Gomez Gardenas on network epidemiology. Okay, so that's the plan for the week. Uh, we try to be short for the presentations, otherwise we're going to be here a long time. Try to explain who you are. Don't. It's informal, of course. It's very informal, so you can even do it in in Portuguese if you prefer. It's not a problem. Um, because the idea is just to, to introduce yourself. Okay, so basically, as I said, uh, this school has covers a lot of things, uh, nonlinear dynamics, uh, complex systems, machine learning, and so on. And my idea here is to do an introduction from dynamical systems to complex systems and time series, because uh, uh, the, my, my course is on time series analysis, especially nonlinear methods. And this is methods to analyze the dynamics of complex systems, to analyze the information that we can obtain from complex systems. And for this, we need, really need to have an idea, a broad overview of dynamical systems, dynamical systems that generate the data that we will analyze. So we will do a, a very a brief introduction to to this field of uh, dynamical systems and end up in complex systems. So I want to introduce myself. I am from originally from Montevideo, Uruguay. I did my master and bachelor in Uruguay, and then I did a PhD in physics, in laser physics, in fact, uh, in Braemar College in the United States. I am actually a present professor of physics at the Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya, and this is a picture of our research group. Uh, where we are, <laughs> Catalonia is a small part of Spain, it's over here. My university uh, has campuses in many different towns of Catalonia. I'm based in Terrassa here. This is the building and this is the lab. And uh, over this, uh, I will present some examples uh, over this course on data recorded with the laser lab. And I will try to explain you why this is, might be interesting for neuroscience. So what do we do? We do a lot of different things, <laughs> a lot of different things. Basically, we work on nonlinear dynamics and complex systems, but we try to use uh, data analysis techniques to understand different phenomena in complex systems 
and we are particularly interested in possible applications. So we are will, on my course, I will try to explain why diode lasers can be sometimes act as neurons, have excitable pulses, which similar to neurons, and try to understand uh, how uh, complex uh, networks uh, can um, give rise to what is called uh, extreme events. This is a road wave. We have done some work on roadways. And the techniques that we use to analyze these uh, networks of lasers or networks of uh, neurons can also be used uh, and to in completely different contexts. So in this course, I will also present examples from, for instance, biomedical uh, info data. This is uh, an eye the image of an eye, and we can apply some techniques that we can also borrow from neuroscience. So my, co my intention is to show you how interdisciplinary uh, research work, how you can get inspired from different fields, and the techniques, we also apply them to climate data. I'm not going to present any example on climate here, but the techniques that we use to analyze the complex uh, dynamical system that is the Earth can also be used to understand uh, brain signals and extract information from brain signals. So basically, that's the plan. As I said, uh, we can use time series analysis tools to uncover very si interesting similarities between lenses and neurons. We can also try to detect extreme events and extreme uh, transitions, abrupt transitions, and use the laser data to, to as, as a toy model to generate data under controlled conditions. We have this type of transitions between different dynamical regimes and we can generate lots of data with the laser and also with the laser we can generate extreme events which are somehow analogous to uh, ocean road waves which are very dangerous extreme waves and we can have this uh, type of behavior very similar in the laser system. So in my first class I will start with the original theory of dynamical systems and uh, work all the way up to the end of uh, machine learning and data science. Many of these topics will be covered with uh, people giving lessons here, like Anna is going to talk about uh, bifurcations and dynamical systems and, and Jesus will talk about the Kuramoto. I will just give a, a very brief introduction to all this and then use, uh, present in the second and third class specific techniques of time series analysis. So dynamical systems. <laughs> the dynamical systems theory started with the work of Newton and Poincaré. Basically, Newton me mechanics was uh, the, the try to solve analytically the, the, the equations of uh, the Newton equations and obtain the, the planetary orbit. So we can solve the problem, that's nice have analytical solution, but when you try to solve more than two bodies, that's not possible. And then Poincaré decided that we can take a different approach, and was that the first introduction to what is known now as the phase space. The phase space of the system, uh, it can have three variables, but we know now that if you have a particle in a three-dimensional space, actually you have six, uh, six initial conditions, position and velocity, so the phase space would actually be larger. And Poincaré recurrence theorem says that certain systems, after a while, may, maybe a long time, will come back to a very initial, a very a state very close to the initial state. So this was a kind of a solution, partial solution to the free body problem because people wanted to know, well, the, the planets will eventually uh, escape or not. So he didn't actually find this, the trajectories, but uh, uh, the idea was to try to find properties of the trajectories. We don't know exactly the trajectory, but we can say some things about how the system is going to behave, analyzing this uh, phase space. So that was, um, he also had the idea of the possibility of chaos. The first uh, general idea was that system can be deterministic. The concept of a deterministic system is that the evolution depends only on initial conditions. There are no randomness, nothing. But still, it can be a periodic and unpredictable. And two very close initial conditions eventually lead to very different uh, evolution. That's the idea of um, chaos. And one of the things that we want to do in time series analysis is to 
uh, determine the prediction horizon and how how reliable this is. So uh, the next progress was in the 50s and 60s when the first computer simulations produced a huge advance on the field of dynamical systems. And the most remarkable was in the 60s when Edward Lorenz found a very famous chaotic attractor with a simple three-dimensional uh, model for the atmosphere. So this is uh, very famous. I want to know who has heard of this attractor, who's familiar, most of you maybe. Okay, so uh, basically this is a famous attractor and from here uh, we start uh, analyzing uh, with computers, performing uh, experiments with computers. But can we observe chaos experimentally? Of course, we know now, yes, but at that time the first observation was with lasers. There were actually two papers in the same issue of physical review letters, this is just one. So this is just to tell you that even long ago, lasers were used uh, to generate as dynamical systems to generate data to test uh, models. Okay, so in the 70s, there was this development on another interesting uh, uh, finding, which is very simple mathematical models can have very, very complicated dynamics. And this is the example of the logistic map. So the equation is very simple, but it's nonlinear. You, up, you start with a condition here, apply this equation, and obtain the next value. And this is what is called iterated map. It's a type of dynamical system that is discrete, and from one value you obtain the next, uh, applying this nonlinear function. And this can ex have stable points, stable cycles, and also what looks like apparent random fluctuations or oscillations. So let's, let's take a quick look at what happens when I start, I put a parameter here, this is a control parameter, I put some value, I have some initial condition and I generate my trajectory or I generate my time series, sequence of points, by um, applying uh, this equation in an iterative way. So eventually I end up in a steady state, but if I change uh, this, this steady point can be calculated analytically. But if I change this parameter, I start seeing oscillations. From one point, I get another one, and from that one, I go back to my previous point. And then it can be uh, a more complicated oscillator, oscillatory behavior, and then it can be something that looks uh, totally aperiodic. And so it's just a dynamical equation. There's no randomness, but... Um, you can have this type of... Uh, now, this concept of there is a transient dynamics now is getting more and more attention because in real data, we don't know whether the dynamics is transient or not. No? So, basically, after a transient, we have some oscillations, but when we look at something like this, it's not easy to distinguish what is the if this is transient or not. Anyway, the, the first concept of what is a bifurcation diagram is basically plotting versus the parameter uh, the values of the variable with dots. So if we have that all the time values in the time series are all equal, they are all in here, one on top of the other, and then when we have the time series that is an oscillation, we have two values, so we have uh, here two points, and then four points, and then so on. This is the concept of a uh, 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 how to represent the dynamics of the system as a function of a control parameter. And you can see the different type of time series, how they are re end up represented in this diagram. Uh, now, the big surprise was that uh, in, the seven, in 1975, there was some order in the chaos. Some, someone discovered that this chaotic behavior was not so chaotic after all, and there was some order. And that was done by Feigenbaum, that used a programmable, one of the first programmable calculators, to find some hidden orders, essentially the scaling law. If we look at the, at the intervals between consecutive bifurcations, he found that the, all these bifurcations are predictable in some way because they occur with, a, a, with this rate. And I want to show you the computer, the calculator, because this was programmable with some uh, magnetic cars, 
And uh, well, it, it, it was a, a very remarkable achievement because why is this remarkable? Because when you approach a bifurcation, there is a phenomenon that is called critical slowing down. Everything goes slow, so you really need to, uh, if you want to calculate this number with a lot of precision, you need to really disregard a lot of this transient. This transient becomes kind of infinite when you approach this bifurcation. So it's not that trivial to calculate this number. And is of course it can be done. And nowadays, with the computer power we have, we can disregard a very long transients. Of course, if we do that, all these points, this, this diagram will take a lot of time to do. But anyway, so the important thing also is that it's a universal law. So there are many uh, functions, not only the logistic map, that have this uh, characteristic with the same number. That means that many different systems represented by an equation like this with some form general similarity in the form go to uh, chaos in the same way, the period doubling bifurcation. And the question obviously again comes, can we see this in experiments? And then again you now can imagine that we are going to show this in lasers and yes in fact with a modulated laser when keeping constant the frequency and increasing the amplitude we see the period doubling bifurcation. This is done many years ago by Jorge Trediche, and this is the bifurcation diagram. And here you can see that at some point, this something trans very strange happens. There's a, a change. And that's one of the things that we want to do with time series analysis. Can we approach, can you identify early warning signals that something like this, a very critical transition to abrupt transition to a different state that we are approaching? kind of a tipping point. And also the question is, how do we know whether we are in a transient dynamics or we actually have non-transient? Now, later on, the concept of fractal objects uh, was found by Vandelbrot that was working on IBM. So he had access to very <laughs> state-of-the-art computers. So he did very beautiful graphics of uh, simple equations that generate what is called fractal objects, which is, if you zoom in, uh, uh, the object looks the same. And it has a, a fractal dimension. Basically, the idea is uh, the simplest way to see if it's fractal is to count, uh, cover the object with different boxes and count how many boxes you need to cover the object as a, as a function of the size. So basically, in normal, uh, the, the, in a three-dimensional or two-dimensional space or one-dimensional, this goes like this, and so you can estimate a number. And for instance, for real-world objects like broccoli, this number is, is this, for instance, is close to the well free because it's a three-dimensional object, but not really. And the uh, lang, this can be a number that. Uh, is a, is, it has a biomedical uh, significance because it, it can be indicate different type of diseases in the, and also uh, the cost of island are typical or classical examples of fractal objects. So later on is the question of how uh, spatial patterns emerge in nature. No? So thermodynamically speaking, we expect disorder or increased disorder, so, but that's not what we see. We see well-defined structures, and the, the work by Prigozhin took us to uh, got a Nobel Prize, and he was studying uh, systems far from equilibrium and discovered basically the interplay when you have a system far from equilibrium and you continuously give energy to the system to overcome dissipation, this can lead to self-organization. So there are the emergence of dynamic order. These structures can be static, can be dynamic, can be temporal variant. But this concept of interplay of a system that gets an input of energy and there's dissipation, and this uh, system is continuously out of equilibrium. Now, in the 90s, people start thinking, can we synchronize two, two uh, chaotic systems? No? And the first uh, demonstration was done by Pecor and Carol in the 90s, early 90s, that considered two couple uh, Lorentz systems in which the coupling is a bit peculiar. I'm not going to start talking about this. But after a while, the two variables, uh, so the x variable was used to drive here. 
the two variables uh, synchronized and the, the difference when the difference went to zero as time passed, even if the systems were not identical, if they have different, slightly different parameters, the difference after a while remains uh, limited. So, okay, a lot of people start looking at chaos synchronization and the synchronization of chaotic systems. We can hide signals and so on, but can we observe experimentally? the synchronization of two chaotic systems, and again, lasers were one of the first demonstrations of synchronization of lasers, chaotic lasers by Brad Roy and Scott Thorkerboom in the 90, early 90s. And again, you have two chaotic lasers, they, they, they see each other by, by optical coupling, I think, or electronic coupling, and you plotting one variable versus the other, this is a typical way to first analyze if two systems or two time series are synchronized. So this is time series of one system, this is another, and plotting one versus the other, we see this nice cloud of points that it says that these two variables are, are co correlated. Now, again, in time series analysis, we want to do better than this, and we want to quantify synchronization. And maybe the synchronization has some lag, so we need to maybe shift the time series, find the optimal lag, and maybe it's possible that the relationship is a functional relation. They are synchronized, but not on, on, we cannot see it on the variables, but on a function of the variables. So, uh, in fact, the first synchronization observation was done much earlier, but not on chaotic systems, it was on pendula, by he, Christian Huygens. In the mid-600s, he mounted two clocks in a common mount, and then he looked how these two clocks behaved, and this is the original plot. And there's lots of work on, on and videos on the internet on how the, the clocks synchronize most of the time in antiphase, but also it's possible that they synchronize in phase when they are coupled through this uh, mount in which they hang in. So the conservation of energy and momentum means that typically they do, they move uh, an antiphase, but it's also possible that they both go together, then the mount goes the other way, and so on. Okay, so at the same time, the question is, uh, what's the role of noise? Uh, people start thinking, what is uh, in nonlinear systems, okay? Because uh, typically, uh, we want to get rid of noise, the uh, noise is a problem, but noise might be also very useful. And that's the idea of the, in the late 80s and 90s, how noise can be useful. And the first example was what is known as stochastic resonance. Has anybody heard here of uh, stochastic resonance? A few? A few. Okay, so the idea here is that an optimal level of noise in a nonlinear system can improve the performance of the system. Whatever the system does can do it better. And this example is a very, I'm not going to put a lot of equations here because I'm not so sure of everybody can follow, but this is a very simple system that has, this represents a double well potential, so it's a B-stable system, has two solutions. And then there is a small sinusoidal oscillation, which by itself is not sufficient to make the system switch between these two solutions. But when we put some level of noise here, an optimal level of noise uh, gives this really periodic switching. So basically here we have the case that the amplitude, the noise is very small. I'm sorry. No, I have to go back. The noise here is, is very small, so it's not sufficient to make the system jump from one state to the other. But if we put larger noise in combination with this signal, the signal and the noise makes the system switch between the two states in a very, rather very, very regular way. And if we put too much noise, then there is uh, no regular oscillation. So in a, in here we, we have a first example that we can generate regular oscillations with noise. Um, can we observe it? Again, with lasers. We can even say that this doesn't have to be periodic. So if we don't have, you can see here in the output of a laser, uh, a small signal. 
but it's not sufficient, the signal, to produce switchings. But if we put noise, as we increase the noise, we can see that there are, that now the signal is not periodic. The signal is this one. And we can see how the laser, with sufficient noise, is able to follow this signal. But of course, if we put too much noise, the, it, it is uh, stochastic. To, so here, if we want to encode this small amplitude signal in the output of a laser, and we do want to do this because we want to use small energy signals, we can use noise to, to have in the output of the laser uh, the input signal. Now, can these mechanisms be used by neurons? Now, neurons are excitable systems. They not be stable systems. They don't have two states. What are neurons? Basically, the typical uh, characteristic of a neuron is that if the input is very small, there is a small output response. It's a small perturbation through some stable state here, but it's a threshold system. And because the perturbation can be slightly above this threshold, then it goes to the other side of this fixed point, and then it fires what it has a, a large excursion, a spike. Now, if we have a larger perturbation, a larger perturbation does the same. Produces a, a large, and the spike is the same. In that sense, the system is a is a truly excitable system. Is a no response or a large or a response is nonlinear, highly nonlinear. If we put two perturbations sufficiently apart, we get two pulses. But if these are too close to each other, then the second pulse arrives when the system is not ready to do another spike, so we don't get it. So this is the excitable system characteristics, which for those of you that work with the models of the neurons are very well familiar with. And again, what's the effect of noise? Can, we order, can, we, can neurons use noise to produce some particular type of optimized behavior or responses? And the answer is yes. We don't, coherence resonance means that we don't have to have an external signal. It's just the, the, the excitable system and the noise. And um, what we have is a classical new model for a neuron with noise. And if we don't have any noise, we have parameters in which the system is in a, in a rest, the neuron is in a resting state. But when we put some noise, again, the same thing happens. If the noise is not strong, it produces spikes once in a while. If the noise is too strong, it produces too many, too many spikes. And in the middle, there is kind of optimal regularity. One of the things we do with time series analysis is try to detect this optimal regularity, try to quantify. We will, uh, in this case, it is quantified with the variability of the inter spike intervals and with the correlation time. OK, so can, be, can we observe this uh, with excitable lasers? Yes, we can have excitable lasers. And we can see that when varying the level of noise, we can have an optimal region here where the pulses are very regular, or most regular. And we can also tune this resonance. Suppose you have a system in which the level of noise is fixed, but we have some control parameters that we can change. So in this case, we can vary, apply a signal, vary the frequency of this signal, and by changing this, we can uh, fix, keep in the noise what it is. We can change, obtain, again, a regular pulse, train pulse. So this was new for, for at that time. I think it, noise is, it might be useful. Noise can be, uh, can be used for, for something. And how, what happens in neuroscience or in neural systems? There is a, some controversy. There are some suggestions that says that, in fact, noise can enhance the, the information transfer and can enhance encoding, especially of weak signals, especially in the audio, audio signals. It's possible that there is evidence that neurons can use this very weak uh, noise to enhance and amplify the processing of the signal. So I, I just put some references here for for you if you are interested on in this. Now, what is noise? 
neural noise. What do we mean by, by noise in neural systems? This noise that we are talking about that can enhance uh, performance. We know <laughs> whatever someone's noise is another one's signal. We, and because we have done a lot of work on climate, we know that for a climatologist, the weather is all noise. It filters out, right? Because climate uh, dynamics is in a slow scale and on top, but a lot of people, of course, care about the weather and not the climate. So basically, noise produces diffusion. This is a cartoon of the random walk. So it's a, like when you have a particle subject to noise, it can diffuse in a, some sort of a space. And one of the main problems of time series analysis is how to find your signal. Which is the signal? How can you really filter out noise? Are you sure you're filtering out noise or maybe it's important information? So typically, uh, a typical problem, a situation in, in neuroscience is to use what is known a point process. So transform the time series into a sequence of times, no? spikes. No, that's why we're going to be talking in my, my next class. Have a time series and transform into a sequence of spikes and then just focus on the spike times, right? But here, we might be missing a lot of information when we do this. So typically, we need to think of using several analysis techniques, several time series analysis techniques to complement and obtain different information. Now, in the 90s and 20s, in 2000s, people start thinking, okay, let's synchronize more. Can we synchronize large uh, sets of nonlinear elements? No? This is a picture that comes from a tree in Malaysia. And what we have see, what you see here is a, a set of insects that if there are enough insects in the tree, they synchronize and they flash all together. And this looks like basically a, a, a Christmas tree that is on and off, right? It's a very uh, interesting phenomenon, but only if we have enough insects in the tree. So how can we model this? The classical model, I oh, know, sorry, I wanted to show you before another example, more recent, more, more to, our, to, to what happened in 2000 with the opening of the London Millennium Bridge. Who knows what happened? Nobody heard of this? Uh, some of you maybe? Okay, yeah, from my previous class. <laughs> I think I, yeah, 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 I talk about this in October. Anyway, I have the queen here crossing the bridge. It's okay, it's not a problem. But when you have too many people on that bridge, okay, the bridge starts oscillating. And they had to close the bridge and spend a fortune trying to fix the problem. And so this is, again, something that synchronization that emerges because we have a large number of elements, interacting elements. And it was explained by, by Strogas in, in, in a five years later on, on a paper in, in Nature. So the classical model, and we're going to hear about this from Jesus quite a lot. I'm not going to talk too much. Just, the, just give you a, a simple example. The classical model of, of phase oscillators. You have phase oscillators, and they are coupled in a simple way. In this, the simplest version, all of all, all, they all see each other, and then eventually, if the coupling is strong enough, there is synchronization. And this is the simplest way to explain collective behavior. How to quantify? We have this order parameter that just adds all these vectors, and if they are incoherent, they are sufficiently large number, you have a zero, but if they are coherent, then they are all aligned, and you have a one. And something in between is partial synchronization. The, the, the behavior is quite complex. And essentially, there is a transition. There's a coupling of strengths above which the system synchronizes. And they synchronize in a particular way. And uh, plotting versus the coupling of strengths, you have that the synchronization is, can be very high for high coupling. There's a video here. I don't know if Jesus was planning to mention, but just in case, this is quite fun because um, this uh, a TED video shows how people uh, clapping, how how clapping uh, um, occurs when people start clapping. Anyway, from the 2000s out to now, we are now more interested in complex systems. So we don't care about 
chaos anymore or chaos is, is, is kind of well understood. And we now want to understand the dynamics of complex systems, which are uh, large numbers of interacting elements, which must be nonlinear. Otherwise, it's, it's, uh, what we're going to be talking about, it all refers to nonlinear systems. And that's important because a reductionist approach doesn't work. So it doesn't work that you divide the system in different parts and you try to understand the, the behavior of the system in this way. It cannot be predicted from the behavior of the individual units. It's the emergence, emergence of different type of behavior. And typically, we use networks, or graph, to try to use it as a mathematical tool to understand complex systems. And this uh, network approach allows to understand many features that are not present in the individual elements. For instance, the main problem is to understand how the structure of the system and the dynamics of the individual elements in the system give rise to uh, some collective behavior. Dif different, what I'm showing here is different structures of networks, I guess. Who's not familiar with networks? A few, OK. So basically, here we have a regular network of neighbors and our regular network all to all. But in general, you have different structures. Here you have a random network, and this is a network with some nodes, some elements which are more important, have a lot of connections. This is what is called scale free. And this network has applications for communication networks, transports, epidemic, and neuroscience is what we will be talking more here. Of course, networks uh, can be, as I show you, but now we know that networks can be formed by different elements, different networks, right? For instance, if you are talking about social networks, you can have uh, people that are friends in Facebook, and different people that follow in Twitter and LinkedIn, and this is uh, this this can be considered as a, as a multi-layer network. Multi-layer approach: you have that the nodes are always the same, but the links depend on the different layers. For instance, we can, to give you an example more close to neuroscience or biology, you can have a set of proteins, and with a technique, with an analysis technique, let's say imaging technique, you get some interactions. But if you use another technique, some chemical reactions or whatever, you have another net interaction. So the, 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 the proteins are always the same, but the network that you obtain depends on the method that you use to analyze. And networks of networks too. You in, in, in the brain systems or in physiological systems or real systems, you have uh, different types of uh, networks, which of course are interdependent. No, so an extreme event or a critical transition in one network can affect the whole system, and then again it can be a cascade of failures. And this is also something that people are really uh, working on very very hard nowadays. And there can be interactions between more than two elements. So basically, the, the network approach means that elements interact by pairs. But why not high order interactions? So that can be represented by what is known as implicial complexes. So if we have a network like this, a zero simplex is a node. If we have a link between two, it's one simplex. But it can be free that always act together. So that's represented by a two simplex or higher order, a simplicial complex. In neuroscience, this is a very interesting technique to analyze how neurons can spike simultaneously. We have, for instance, four neurons here, and we only look at the spikes. We can see that there are time intervals in which, for instance, this one cyan and the red are active. Then there is another time interval in which the cyan is acting with the blue. Then we, nothing happens or it spikes. But then there are the three of them become active. So here we can represent this as a matrix representation in the sense that um, this interval here, these three are active. In this interval here, these two are active. And in this one, so this represented by these four neurons. There is a triplet here, and there are links between them. OK? So this is a technique that is uh, quite being, being uh, used a lot in, in to understand uh, how ne ne neural systems uh, coordinate simultaneous activity. 
And oh, cannot finish this presentation well, um, without talking about the Nobel Prize in Physics a couple of years ago for groundbreaking contributions to an understanding of complex systems. In part to these two, for climate science and uh, Siruko Manabare and Klaus Hasselman for, uh, for giving simple models that allow to really understand what's happening with global warming and for Giorgio Parisi for the discovery of the interplay of disorder and fluctuations in physical systems and this applies from atomic to planetary scale. So this, is, uh, this was a huge uh, um, moment for complex science, complexity science, because we have always been like, oh, this is not physics, not mathematics, it's not climate, it's not biology, but it's all of it. Okay? And the important concept here is that we can borrow techniques from different fields and adapt them to whatever we are working on. So which systems are complex? What are the characteristics of complex systems? Of course, we have, have a large number of elements. I cannot say 5, 10, 20, but it should be a, a system with three or four variables is not usually considered a complex system. And they have to have nonlinearity somewhere, no? They have to interact in a nonlinear way, or they have to be nonlinear. And usually, these systems have a lot of different time scales, no? In temporal time scales or spatial time scales. So they have these multi, multi time scale characteristics. And the structure of the system is heterogeneous, meaning a random system is not complex, and a fully ordered system is also not complex. And the response of such a system to a change or a perturbation is usually unexpected. And it's usually some sort of adaptation and contraintuitive. Some people say that a definition of a, of a complex system is a system that cannot be controlled. Okay? That's an alternative idea of what a complex system is. A large linear system <laughs> can be complicated, but it's not complex. Okay? You divide the system in parts, you solve the parts, and then put together. So what do we do with time series analysis? We analyze the outputs of complex systems, OK? So let's say this, uh, we have this time series coming from somewhere. What do we do with this? The idea is that we extract features, OK? This is an example of some features that we obtain. We calculate some probabilities of some symbols or some probabilities of some events or whatever. Or it can be some other type of uh, frequencies or Whatever we do, we obtain a set of numbers. And then a possibility is to use what is called dimensionality reduction. Compress all these features into one number. For instance, the entropy. We will talk about, Osvaldo will talk a lot <laughs> about the entropy. I'm not going to go into this, all right? But what do you do with this entropy? Well, maybe it's sufficient to differentiate. If you have a lot of time series, you can do the same for each of them. And then see, what do you get in terms of entropy? Maybe you can classify type A or type B. Maybe this is not possible. What can you do otherwise? Well, you can, instead of using this idea of dimensionality reduction, you can look at your features, maybe a lot, and then start comparing pair by pair, try to find or use a principal component analysis, something like this. Who's familiar with that? OK, I see. So, OK, so you eventually find some discrimination between two states. And this is basically <laughs> what, I, uh, what I have just said. OK, there are many algorithms. I'm just presenting one in which you have a lot of systems, different systems with different, for instance, uh, different genotypes or different uh, people with schizophrenia versus healthy systems or Parkinson versus health. So you have a lot of time series that can be classified into two different categories, OK? And you can use many time series analysis methods to obtain a large number of features, all right? This, uh, this paper in particular has this algorithm and has been evolved since then. And you can obtain a large number of features. What you plot here in color code, here in the horizontal, in the horizontal are the different features from 1 to 7,000. And in ver the vertical is a, an index that labels each time series. So you have, let's say, 100 time series, 50 and 50. So we have, and we can see that 
from the matrix, we cannot maybe do much, it looks okay, but then we have to process this information. And after processing this information, is a, a step of a statistical learning in which we might find some magnitude, which allows to perfectly separate into categories, or we can have dimens uh, dimensionality reduction and find features that are able to separate this situation. Okay? So basically, this is the concept of time series analysis. What do we do? We use different methods to obtain features. Okay? What to do with the features? As I said, machine learning. And then there are different ways to analyze and, and, and this, uh, obtain different uh, approaches to, to, to separate, for instance, into categories. So to summarize, from dynamical systems to complex systems and data science. Uh, dynamical system theory is about bifurcations, it's about low dimensional attractors, chaotic attractors. This allows us to uncover that the fact that chaos is not so and a structure, there's a structure in chaotic systems, and there's also universal features in chaotic systems. Then we have the synchronization properties. We have the synchronization of a few elements, that, or we can expect that as the, the system size increases, there is some other phenomena that come up, and might be critical transitions to different states, okay? so. What we try to do is see if we are approaching some tipping point and try to use time series analysis methods to obtain like early warning signals of something like this happening. And that's the point, we obtain features which we hope that can provide information about the signal. And this is really uh, data science, feature selection, what, which ones are useful, which ones are not usable, and how can we cl use them to for classification of forecasting. This is a, a fast growing field with lots of applications. So uh, I think I finish here. Yeah. Uh, I think I finish here. If you have uh, questions. Yes, yes, minutes. Okay, perfect. So I wanted to have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, if questions, comments. Questions or comments? <laughs> okay, even better. Tell me. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Interesting question. Yes, good question. What is the difference with <laughs> what is the difference between a tipping point and a bifurcation point? A, a bifurcation point. Uh, I can show. Let's see if I can go back to my presentation. Uh, I don't know if I can go back to the presentation. Uh, um, Here we have bifurcations, right? Uh, no, is is a, a solution becomes unstable and a new solution appears, right? The concept of a bifurcation is very well understood mathematically, and Anna is going to talk about that if I understand. No, but a tipping point refers to a more generic situation, a more generic change of behavior. Something happens in the system and, the si and there is a, tra a, 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 a transition. And I show this map because we have here a point. In these two branches merge. Okay? These two merge. And this is not a bifurcation point. But there are quant So if you look at, for instance, the Lyapunov exponent, nothing happens here. The Lyapunov exponent doesn't detect this type of transition. But there are uh, quantifiers which have an abrupt change here because some changes in the in the time series, the, 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 this branch and this branch become interacting. So it's just an example. Uh, a tipping point is approaching a transition which is more a change in, in the behavior of the system, not necessarily because of a bifurcation, but some 
So bifurcation usually is something that we can identify in low dimensional systems. In high dimensional systems, systems with uh, this is you can think this is low dimensional because it's just one equation, but it's a iterated equation. So it's very uh, it has more complexity in, my, in some sense. Uh, what I want to say is that there is a change in behavior of the system which doesn't come from a bifurcation. So a tipping point includes a bifurcation point, but can be something happening in a high dimensional space, which is, for instance, uh, for some reason, the system can start visiting a, a, a region of the phase space that was not visited before. So once in a while, now this region is accessible and you have the occurrence of extreme events. Extreme pulses can start to occurring once in a while. And maybe they become more and more frequent with some parameter or with time. But this is a change in the phase space, not necessarily a bifurcation, not necessarily because a fixed point turned unstable or some new attractor appeared. Maybe it's just a change in the phase space that allows the system to visit this region that generates extreme events. In the climate system, we are all worried about tipping points, of course, because it means that we are approaching some, uh, some very, uh, can be very dangerous situation, no? Very, and there's, of course, a lot of efforts trying to uh, infer, also in ecological systems, whether a population is going to extinguish or not, or there will be an alga boom in a, um, in a lake, something like that. It's more generic. Bifurcation is usually for low dimensional systems. For high dimensional complex systems, things can happen which you might not be able to trace back to some bifurcation in a dimen low dimensional space. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, it, this, is a, this is a tipping point because a new solution becomes a stable, no? This is a, a this is a, can be a, a a tipping point here because as yeah yeah and the tipping point can also come from multi-stability. The solutions always exist, but for some reason there is, you are uh, there's a, a change in behavior and you have another solution like here. This one here. No, it is chaotic. It is chaotic. The point is that it's not described exactly for or for an interval of control parameters or values. The logistic map is a good representation of the system. But if this amplitude becomes too large, then the logistic map is not, and then something different happens. This could be also a tipping point, approaching a tipping point because there's but in this case, it's a bifurcation, uh, or at least we can think of a bifurcation. But maybe this this laser is sufficiently complex to. Well, I think it's a bifurcation. In this case, it's a bifurcation. On no, in this case, uh, I think this this parameter is too large, and it just controls. It, it controls, com so probably it suppresses these pulses. It's, it's probably a, it suppresses the. Uh, 
Yes, I don't know if we can think of the Kunamoto transition as a bifurcation. I'm not an expert on that. Can we say it's a bifurcation? No, no. Also, basically, bifurcation we consider like uh, a small dimensional, low dimensional systems. And in general, you have transition to different dynamical regimes. And approaching some of these transitions is when you think you're approaching a tipping point. But there is an article you can look at. Uh, what do we, I can send it to you, what do you, we mean by a tipping point? And then there are practical examples. Okay? Uh -huh. Okay, so we do a coffee break, pause, a stop, and we continue in half an hour. No? Half an hour, is it? <laughs>